Take a moment to appreciate how awesome it is to be able to go to the bathroom and flush it all away. It's pretty great, right? But what do you know about where the wastewater goes after you flush? Are you familiar with your jurisdiction's wastewater system? What about the water supply needed to flush to begin with? Are you familiar with your jurisdiction's water supply? Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Smith. I am the wastewater division manager for the city of Watsonville, located here on the central coast in California. Here in the United States and the rest of the developed world, we have come to believe wastewater systems are the gold standard of sanitation. But what if a wastewater system was rendered inoperable due to a natural disaster such as a flood or earthquake? What if a community's water and wastewater systems were overwhelmed due to sudden climate-induced migration? What if there was an inadequate water supply to keep a wastewater system functioning? These are the types of questions that keep me up at night, and I believe we should all be asking ourselves and talking about. The rise in popularity of the flushing toilet in the mid-1800s propelled the United States into the current wastewater paradigm. Although it has arguably improved quality of life, continuing the wastewater paradigm is becoming problematic due to water's increasing scarcity, mounting costs, contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, and deleterious environmental effects. The reality is that there are two ways to manage human excreta, with systems that use water and with systems that do not. Either way is an acceptable method of providing sanitation services. My thesis explored the problem area of the wastewater paradigm and sought to understand how waterless sanitation systems would benefit homeland security. I chose the central research question because I have been operating, maintaining, and managing publicly owned wastewater systems since 2005 and had often wondered if there was an alternative to wastewater conveyance and treatment. Although there has been a noticeable paradigm drift in the industry and a focus on recovering resources from wastewater such as energy, nutrients, and recycled water, at the core, sewers and wastewater treatment facilities still require water to function in the first place. These systems tend to not function properly when there is too little or too much of it. I used a two-pronged approach for the research design, appreciative inquiry and interviews with human subjects. Appreciative inquiry revealed how the modern wastewater paradigm evolved in the first place, as well as acceptable alternatives. Human subjects using waterless sanitation systems were interviewed to obtain qualitative data and understand their personal experiences, challenges, and insights into those practices. My analysis revealed a specific low-tech method of providing sanitation services without using water as a means of conveyance and the challenges associated with managing those systems. The findings were consistent with my expectations, but first I'd like to describe how wastewater systems evolved in the first place. With the popularity of the flushing toilet growing exponentially since the mid-1800s, people started to replace their latrines and chamber pots. Open ditches were replaced with sewers to transport nuisance sites and odors caused by sewage away from system users, which ultimately resulted in negative environmental impacts. For the last 170 or so years, various methods of wastewater treatment have been invented and legislation enacted to protect public health and the environment, and we continue to propel the paradigm forward to this day. Today, there are over 17,000 wastewater treatment plants that serve 76% of the 327 million people who reside in the United States. The rest of the population is served by on-site septic systems, unless people do not have adequate access to sanitation at all, but more on that in a minute. From a sanitation viewpoint, the evolution of this wastewater paradigm might appear to be a wild success, significantly improving public and environmental health. In truth, it is rather problematic. Wastewater systems are expensive to build and operate, result in nutrient and other types of pollution, and both contribute and are vulnerable to climate change. Research also revealed one significant below the horizon homeland security issue known as peak phosphorus, which is, like peak oil, the point in time that the mining of phosphorus rock reaches maximum production. The element phosphorus is essential to food production and the second most important nutrient for plant growth next to nitrogen. And 80% of mined phosphorus becomes commercial fertilizer. Planet Earth's phosphorus reserves are declining and theorists have estimated that they will be depleted within the next 100 years. Only five countries control 85% of the world's phosphate rock and 75% of those reserves are located in Morocco. Considering that 80% of mined phosphorus becomes commercial fertilizer, and given exponential increases in global population, 
Some intervention will be needed to avoid the crisis of phosphorus scarcity and geopolitical conflict resulting from the power struggle over control over this finite resource. In addition to peak phosphorus, another alarming trend is the increased frequency of day zero incidents. Simply put, day zero happens when a community's demand for water exhausts its supply and water ceases to flow from taps. Cape Town, South Africa, a city of nearly 4 million people, narrowly escaped a day zero event in 2018. Now three years later in 2021, the city is bracing again for this possibility. Day zero incidents are evident right now here in the United States. For example, water wells in the scenic coastal town of Mendocino in Northern California have depleted their aquifer and water is being purchased and trucked in from other community water supplies in Mendocino County. Interestingly enough, although this situation has garnered much state and national press, so far the term day zero has not been used. So what are the alternatives to traditional wastewater systems? Porta potties? Well, no, because they require water, and there must be a wastewater treatment facility to haul the contents to. Instead, research revealed a method known as container-based sanitation that follows the principles of ecological sanitation and provide the same services along what's known as the sanitation service chain. The steps of collecting, emptying, transporting, treating, and ultimately reusing human excreta. That's right, reusing our own excreta. It may seem obvious, but our urine and feces contain the nutrients used in agriculture, most notably nitrogen and phosphorus. By recycling this material back into agricultural soils, we are effectively closing the loop on life-sustaining nutrient cycles. But wait, there's more. Considering just water alone, I estimate over one and a half trillion gallons of potable water is flushed down the toilet every year in the United States. This is water that could instead be used for consumption and hygiene. For context, this translates to roughly 5 million acre feet of volume, or enough to supply all of the water needs for 15 million households. The literature and interview with human subjects describe a container-based sanitation process that replicates a similar user experience where one urinates and defecates into a container, often a simple five-gallon bucket, then covers the excreta with a carbonaceous material of appropriate size to absorb moisture and prevent nuisance odors. A full container is replaced with an empty one, its contents are transported to a location and treated, often through composting, and the resulting material is applied to the land after sufficient pathogen and vector reduction is achieved. The beauty of container-based sanitation is that it is rapidly deployable, scalable, and affordable compared to traditional wastewater systems. It can range in size from a single household with a garden and compost pile to a full-scale operation servicing an entire community. But consider a real possible natural or man-made disaster impacting your jurisdiction's water and wastewater systems. It would be extremely challenging and complex to rapidly implement container-based sanitation, requiring multiple stakeholder engagement among your staff and governing body, the pertinent regulatory agencies, and the community. Therefore, planning ought to occur right now. Consistent with the findings, I propose the following recommendations. One, incorporate container-based sanitation into disaster preparedness, response, and recovery plans. Two, design and implement pilot studies for long-term sustainable utilization of container-based sanitation. Three, permit container-based sanitation for people and communities lacking a traditional wastewater system or with a failed one. And four, develop consistent regulations, policies, and guidelines across local and state jurisdictions to allow for container-based sanitation. Let's think about instances where container-based sanitation could be effective. Where are wastewater systems being affected by flooding, earthquakes, and extreme drought? Where are there impoverished communities that cannot afford a traditional wastewater system? Where are numerous people congregating in a location with insufficient wastewater infrastructure or none at all? Emergency response and recovery operations, music festivals, refugee camps, homeless encampments, and temporary military bases are all prime examples where container-based sanitation would be effective. Interviews with human subjects revealed some hurdles to overcome include people's attitudes around their own excreta, inconsistent regulations, finding an adequate cover material of appropriate size and quantity, and knowledge gaps in managing a waterless system. Now take a moment to think about challenges in implementing container-based sanitation when needed. Does your jurisdiction's regulations support, prevent, or even address it? Can you identify a local source of carbonaceous cover material, and do you need equipment to process it to the right size and quantity? Where will the composting or other treatment of excreta take place? 
How will you educate users of the system in order for them to change their attitudes and behavior? Who will manage the system and how will they be educated? In closing, I propose we reframe our thinking around wastewater. It is one method of providing sanitation services, not the only way. I will reiterate that the primary purpose of any sanitation system is to protect public and environmental health. Waterless, container-based solutions achieve the same outcomes as wastewater systems with the added benefits of significantly reduced costs, the ability to rapidly scale up or down, not requiring water to function properly, and recycling nutrients back into the soil. After all, it's only human waste if we waste it. Thank you for your attention to this unconventional topic. I welcome anyone who wants to explore this idea further to contact me at the email and phone number listed below.